The Education and Resource Centre is proud to present Associate Professor Edwina Wright, a physician in the Infectious Disease Department at Alfred Health, Monash University and the Burnett Institute. This podcast will outline the spectrum of neurocognitive disorders that can develop for some people living with HIV and give health professionals information on where to engage appropriate clients into neurocognitive health care. Today I'm going to talk to you about HIV-associated neurocognitive disorders, which also goes by the somewhat clumsy name of HAND, and I'd like to discuss this with you because it's a very prevalent problem in uh, the community of people living with HIV, and people who are caring for them may in fact be the first ones to notice um, the signs and symptoms of, of these disorders. So to put HAND, or HIV-associated neurocognitive disorders, in perspective, what I have on this slide is um, a schematic which shows you what sort of neurological problems people may have when they become HIV infected and at which stage they develop different um, neurological problems. So up the top you'll see stages 1, 2 and 3 and these are the stages that um, the CDC in the United States uses to denote the different clinical stages of HIV. So you can see there in stage 1, individuals have uh, relatively high CD4 cell counts over 500 and um, they may in fact uh, experience an encephalitis or a meningitis, typically around the time that they seroconvert for, with HIV. And individuals with these CD4 cell counts may occasionally also develop a, a facial nerve palsy or other uh, nerve-based problems including Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, about 5 to 7% of people d will develop a neurological problem at the time of seroconversion. Then if you come to stage 2 and the individual hasn't received any antiretroviral therapy, their CD4 cell counts will decline as you know over time. And then individuals become a little bit more vulnerable to other um, neurological disorders. And if you look down there, you'll see that asymptomatic and minor neurocognitive disorders can be experienced by individuals with reasonably high CD4 cell counts. And these are some of the features or components of HAND. Finally, uh, if you come to stage three, in, in this stage, individuals are usually really quite symptomatic. They have CD4 cell counts under 200 or, or even have experienced an AIDS illness. And you can see there by looking at the slide, the, the majority of neurological disorders that occur in untreated HIV positive populations occur when individuals have low T cell counts. And they include things like t TB in the brain, TB meningitis, HIV dementia, uh, the asymptomatic and minor neurocognitive disorders which we'll discuss and other forms of neurological opportunistic infections and um, cancers like primary um, uh, CNS lymphoma. So to put this in perspective and remembering that we, although we, we identify uh, with uh, Europe and England and the US, we actually live in, in Asia and the Pacific region. So. Um, worldwide, there are around three, 35 million people living with HIV, but in our region we have a, actually a very high number of people living with HIV, which is around 4.8 million people. And if you look down at the bottom right hand side of the slide, what you, what you see there is the proportion of people who really should be on antiretroviral therapy according to the most current WHO guidelines you can see the proportion who are actually receiving it and that's about 37 percent. In the left hand corner globally about 10 million people need therapy and again only about a third or so of people are receiving it. So to try and put that together in terms of what we're talking about today HIV related neurological problems you can imagine that a large proportion of people in our region who should be on treatment with low CD4 cell counts are not getting treatment and hence they're vulnerable to um, a number of those neurological disorders that we just saw on the previous slide. So let's now um, confine the rest of this talk to HIV associated neuro neurocognitive disorders um, and I'm just reminding you there that typically they occur in individuals um, as with lower CD4 cell counts. So, as I said, that clumsy kind of acronym HAND, there are three disorders um, under the umbrella of HAND. 
The first is called asymptomatic neurocognitive impairment, and it is just that. It's almost more a research term in the sense that um, an individual might come in and say, no, I'm fine, I'm well, I'm working, have no problems, and you say, well, let's, let's do a neuropsychological test battery and put you in a room for a couple of hours and really test you. And it might be that when you do challenge the individual with those tests, that in fact you find that if compared to their HIV negative age and gender match controls in the community, in fact they, they are performing under par, but they don't have symptoms. And so that's called ANI. Mild neurocognitive disorder is the second component of HAND, and I think that's what, as healthcare providers, we probably see the most of in, our, in working with um, people living with HIV. And here what's key is that the individual in fact has symptoms and um, they are mild symptoms uh, and the individual may still be working or running a household, but they're aware that they're not necessarily on their game. They may have difficulty working in higher levels, so they might have difficulty running, thinking about um, an executive decision at work or um, balancing a budget and thinking about it in their head. If someone interrupts them, they could they can go off um, tack very easily. Um, and if they're at home, they might really not be able to work out how to sort out bills at home or manage the household and keep everything going really smoothly. But people adapt, often adapt to these symptoms and um, and, and also the healthcare practitioner may begin to adapt to finding them just a little bit less crisp. So that's known as mild neurocognitive disorder. And then finally, HIV dementia is the most severe um, component of HAND. And this is where an individual has really significant impairment in their activities of daily living and they won't be working. They would not be able to hold down a job and you couldn't leave them in charge of a house or let them take drive the kids to school or do those sorts of things. Um, these people really do have a dementia and when you test them uh, in that same sort of quite intensive test battery, they would be very impaired compared to their age and gender match controls. Now having said this, um, hand disorders or HIV dementia it's a bit of a tough thing to diagnose in the sense that it's a diagnosis of, of exclusion. So you have to make sure the person hasn't got a delirium, an acute delirious condition, or they don't have any other confounding conditions, and I'll mention those in a minute. So that's the technical um, definition of hand, and I think it actually bears out fairly well in the clinical setting. So this slide is a, like a synopsis, if you like, of, of the picture of hand and, and here um, this slide probably de really depicts somebody with moderate or quite severe dementia. So the clinical findings of somebody with full dementia is that they become very slow in their speech and their affect, um, they are quite slow. Um, they, they can be a bit withdrawn from the world and even um, not really even interested in things that usually give them pleasure. Um, they may not have um, any obvious immediate short-term memory problems, but they lose concentration. Um, you wouldn't be able to engage them in a conversation. They would have trouble following a film or reading a book. Um, and when we examine those patients, there, there, there are no hard neurological signs typically, but you do find that they have um, quite slowed motor, um, uh, motor findings. Um, one of the chief, interestingly, one of the chief um, symptoms is people become quite clumsy and they have difficulty with fine motor movements like undoing their buttons or, you know, signing their name, etc. That can be difficult. In individuals who don't have such a pronounced dementia, um, what we're certainly seeing at the moment in, in a neurocognitive health clinic that we run here at the Alfred Hospital is that some individuals are working and in really in quite high level jobs but it's the really demanding tasks that they begin to realize they cannot um, uh, achieve so that they, they might be uh, have a very important position as a running the finances of a big company or they might be the CEO of a company and they begin to realize that when they're giving talks or doing pitches or working out money and finances they actually have difficulty finding the words synthesizing ideas forgetting people's names, so, but otherwise their lives are running quite well. So those sorts of symptoms are important um, to recognise and for individuals to recognise that that, that that could be a problem. Uh, um, in terms of um, pathogenesis, broadly speaking, 
about 20% overall of individuals with under 200 T cells are vulnerable to, to developing dementia, which I'm sorry, I didn't mention that before. And uh, I think there's probably quite a strong genetic component. Um, individuals are certainly vulnerable to dementia if, if their CD4 cells have gone very, become very low or what we call a very low CD4 cell nadir. We do know that older individuals are more vulnerable to developing dementia if they're HIV positive, and so are people with diabetes. So they're the kind of more the broader the broader groups who are more vulnerable. But on the positive side, 80, about 80 percent of people do not develop HIV dementia. But in terms of what causes it for those who do experience it, it's um, I think relatively strong evidence to suggest that the virus. Uh, enters the brain either hidden in, a, in an infected T cell, like a Trojan horse, or it can perhaps enter directly across the blood brain barrier. And once it's in the brain, it's able to infect other cells in the brain that are also vulnerable to HIV, like the macrophages that sit just on the other side of the blood brain barrier. Their job is to stop bugs and viruses and toxins and things. Uh, and they, however, they're vulnerable, they get infected. And then the brain's natural macrophages, also known as the microglial cells, um, become infected and, and an inflammatory response occurs within the brain. Interestingly, perhaps more as an aside, the astrocytes within the brain, which are like the mother cells of the brain, they nurture the, or the brain and provide a lot of the physical structure, they're also vulnerable to infection, but not a, they don't cause a productive infection. But because HIV gets into them, it interferes with their healthy function, so that in turn uh, adds a stress to the brain and probably adds to the um, damage and impairment. You can see on the slide there, there's um, an X-ray of the brain with some three arrows um, it, uh, denoting the areas of the brain, the chordate, the globus pallidus and the putamen, they're all um, basal ganglia structures. And what this is telling us is that HIV dementia doesn't cause damage to the nerves, the cells at the top of the brain, um, the grey matter like Alzheimer's disease does, but in fact causes dementia and damage down in the deeper parts of the brain, just like um, Parkinson's disease or Huntington's chorea, which as you might recall are, are associated with slowness, slowing of movement and um, change in mood and um, facial expression. So that's where a lot of the damage occurs within the brain. And then to look at the diagnosis um, of HIV, as I mentioned earlier, it is a diagnosis of exclusion. So it's incumbent on the people um, involved in, in helping to investigate it and manage the patient with cognitive problems to send them to a, a clinician who will then arrange for, typically, for a neuropsychological test to be done by a psychologist. Usually an MRI scan or a CT scan of the brain is done to rule out any other major problem that might be present. And quite often um, we will recommend a lumbar puncture, but by no means always. And that's usually just to see if there's actually virus um, replicating in the, in, in, the, in the brain, which can occur in about 10 or 15% of people who, when you take blood peripherally, they have an undetectable viral load. So there, and, and you also have a number of uh, blood tests and other things. Um, the treatment for HIV dementia is at the moment um, the use of three or more drugs that um, have the qualities of being able to get into the brain well, and I'll discuss that a little more in a moment. Um, but as I mentioned, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. And as I said earlier, there are confounding conditions that if they're present m may make you a little bit more cautious about saying, aha, this is HIV dementia. So some of those confounds would be if in fact a person has depression, it's a little bit difficult to say they have dementia if they also have very evident signs of, um, of a major depression. An acute medical illness like acute renal failure or new onset diabetes with, an, with the symptoms, recent heart attack, um, acute hepatitis C, chronic hepatitis C, they, you have to be very aware of those if you, again, if you're trying to say somebody has dementia or if they've had a recent head trauma, etc. Um, I've mentioned that you do neuropsychological testing, the scan and a lumbar puncture, but perhaps to summarise in terms of diagnosis, alas, at the moment at least, there is no single biomarker or a, or a finding on a scan of the brain 
where you say, oh, right, here we go, no question this person has HIV dementia. And in a sense, that's what the field is looking for, a couple of biomarkers that m may be so sensitive and, and, and predict the presence of HIV dementia, it would be wonderful for the field to have that, but we don't yet have that. Also, um, currently, it's very prudent to look at your patient's cardiovascular risk, state, risk status and their current antiretroviral regimen, and I'll, I'll address that in just a moment. So to perhaps elaborate a little more on the treatment of hand, um, it's quite remarkable in the setting of HIV beca dementia because it really is probably one of the only dementias in the world that is truly treatable and may indeed be almost reversible. Um, certainly Alzheimer's disease, that's not the case. Cerebrovascular dementia, uh, people can have some recoveries, but this is actually treating a virus, which in turn leads to improvement in, um, the f uh, in function, and that's why it's such a critical diagnosis to make. So there's evidence that at least 50% of people, um, if you treat them with HIV dementia, treat them with antiretrovirals, they will have a quite remarkable improvement in their neurocognitive performance. And that this improvement can be witnessed in studies even out at 18 months when you're testing them and evaluating them, they're still continuing to improve. And there's evidence that using antiretroviral regimens that, have the, uh, that are made up of drugs that probably get into the brain pretty well is the treatment of choice. The, and the theory here is that the, these more highly penetrating drugs get into the brain better, therefore manage to reduce the viral load in the brain better, and that in turn improves neurocognition. And the way we measure whether or not um, a, a drug does get into the brain is we use a metric known as the CNS penetration effectiveness score, and um, the evidence that, uh, that the, the higher scoring regimens um, uh, are better than lower scoring regimens is largely from um, observational studies. You can see that table lists a number of antiretrovirals and ranks them according to whether they have low penetration, which means they have a score of one, up to a score of four um, old-fashioned drugs like zidovudine, nevirapine and boosted indinavir. We know that those get into the brain well. So I mentioned most of the evidence for using highly penetrating regimen comes from observational studies, not randomized controlled trials. And um, in a recent, uh, there's been a meta-analysis looking at um, 16 studies um, that were designed to determine if higher scoring regimens um, were beneficial. And overall, the trend was that um, they are if a person has HIV dementia. Um, so in, in practice, it's cu common, currently common practice to use high CPE scoring regimens to treat people with HAND. Um, but if they don't have HAND, there's no evidence to say that you should put all your patients from the, the get-go on a highly penetrating regimen. So if you try and take all that and synthesize that and then come back to the clinical setting that you may find yourself in, um, we know that individuals who are cared for in um, hospitals in Victoria with HIV outpatients or GP practices where there's a lot of um, expertise in managing patients, most of the populations in those clinics and outpatients are on treatment and most of them are virologically suppressed. So if you look at that population, what proportion of those patients um, may ha in fact have hand even though they're virologically suppressed? Well, if you look at a number of largely cross-sectional studies in outpatient clinics, about 30% of individuals that we care for and that you will be seeing, in fact, have some form of neurocognitive disorder, which is pretty amazing when you think about it, one in three. Um, and in terms of the frequency, asymptomatic, if it, it, it's probably the asymptomatic impairment is the most common but um, the minor neurocognitive disorder, which if you remember, they're, they're pretty functional, but they have got symptoms. They're more, much more common than people with you know, fully fledged um, dementia, which prevents them from working and, and running their home. So of course it begs the question, um, what, um, what, why is this so? We've got these wonderful antiretrovirals that um, can fully suppress the virus in someone's plasma you know, sometimes within the shortest time as a month. Why does this occur? And this slide largely summarises the, the theories around it. So in terms of it being 
just neurocognitive uh, impairment purely as a result of HIV, could it be, the, as it says there in the first line, a legacy effect? So, in other words, you're looking after someone who was infected perhaps in the mid-1990s, no, say early 1990s, they had maybe some monotherapy, double therapy, and then hey presto, in 1996, they got triple therapy. And, and since then, they've been, you've been looking after them and they've stayed on their treatment, but they, they've never really been quite right. So what the legacy effect suggests is that when that individual was vulnerable to having um, dementia develop before triple therapy became available, they did have some cognitive damage and cognitive impairment. Then you treated them with triple therapy that stopped it in its tracks, but it was it, the damage was done. So they live forward, they move forward in their lives with um, a fixed kind of deficit. And what you can tell, the way you can tell that is because over time, in, in, in this field of medicine, time is your friend, in six months or 12 months, they'll say, no, I'm just the same. I haven't got better, but I certainly haven't got worse. And you can, in fact, um, uh, uh, test that against um, the neuropsychological test results that you do over time, where the neuropsychologist will come back and say, no, there's no change, they're stable. So you can kind of relax a bit. That's probably the legacy effect. And that definitely occurs in a proportion of individuals. What about poor CNSHIV control? Well, I mentioned earlier that um, individuals may be beautifully virologically suppressed when you draw the blood peripherally. But in fact, in again, cross-sectional studies, not randomised controlled trials, um, you, you may do lumbar punctures in, in individuals with neurological symptoms and in fact perhaps up to 15% have in fact got uncontrolled viral replication in their brain because the CSF viral load is quite high. And you, the reasons for that typically is, is that the regimen that they're on isn't getting into the brain well enough and con not controlling the virus in the brain or the virus in their brain has a, is in fact made up more of, vir of viruses that are resistant to the regimen that the patient's on. The virus in the periphery is sensitive, so they're virologically suppressed. So um, that's when you sus one suspects that, um, that's when you may in fact push to have a lumbar puncture done to do the viral load. And in that setting, you would change their regimen, work out if they're resistant to it, and put them on a regimen that manages the virus both peripherally and in their brain. And the third um, hypothesis, where it's purely just HIV continuing to hammer away in the brain, is that perhaps what happens, and, and I think this is probably very likely, is that there, all the time there is very low level virus being turned over and replicating within the, the tissue of the brain, you know, like maybe something in the order of one or two copies per mil of blood, if we think of it that way, but low levels of virus driving inflammation and damage in the brain. Um, and uh, Or if there's not virus, what's happened is that the, the virus has been in the brain, set up an inflammatory environment, and then that just keeps the momentum going and the brain um, is just a, under constant um, immune, a state of immune activation. And then importantly, and I think clinically this is something that should be distinguished, and I mentioned cardiovascular risk factors before, what we think we see is that individuals may have hand, which is the virus directly affecting the brain, plus then as they age and make lifestyle choices such as smoking or, you know, if they haven't got a lot of money and they can't afford a good diet, then they eat a diet that's not good for them. They have weight gain and um, high cholesterol, diabetes. But if those cardiovascular risk factors may also have an impact and do be doing some damage to the brain and the function. So you've got hand plus um, hand, uh, you have hand uh, and other additional risk factors, or maybe there's a synergy with HIV and hypertension, for example, together may cause brain problems. And in research that um, I've been involved with, we have shown that high blood pressure and high cholesterol definitely are associated in virologically suppressed individuals, if they have hypertension or high cholesterol, their neurocognitive performance is worse than those individuals who don't have those, those problems. Um, another uh, sort of factor that's not directly related to HIV is perhaps they do have, so their brain becomes more vulnerable to neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's disease. 
And again, that's probably because the virus has upset the brain, started off some inflammatory changes, and, and there's only so many roads that lead to Rome. So when you damage the brain, you may get buildup of plaques in the brain, like Alzheimer's disease, other uh, pathways of neurodegeneration. So, for example, we see, uh, we think we're seeing early onset um, Parkinson's disease in HIV. And we may, there's quite a lot of different evidence from different um, fields of medicine, laboratory, clinical, and, and uh, basic science evidence to suggest that we may in fact be seeing more Alzheimer's disease pictures in people with HIV. So that may be having an impact on somebody who's coming into you saying, I know I'm not right, I just can't put my finger on it, but I know I'm not thinking as well as I should. Age is also another factor. As we all age, our, our brain performance changes and some, in some ways for the better, in other ways not. So perhaps um, it's the impact of hand plus aging or hand synergistically with age. And that evidence is just starting to come out now. And as our cohorts and age, perhaps that's what we're going to see more of it over time. And finally, um, is it possible that in fact some of the regimens that we use um, they, in, in their own right, are in fact quite toxic to the brain. And we certainly have seen some fascinating studies where individuals were on high penetrating regimens and for whatever reason when they stopped those regimens or switched them, in fact their neurocognitive performance improved. Um, so um, we also know, for example, the drug of Favrin's has definitely has, has CNS uh, or brain to, uh, side effects, including depression and um, decreased kind of awareness and fatigue. So perhaps in a way we are at, at inadvertently combining drugs in people whose brains are vulnerable to high concentrations of those drugs. That might be another component of why we're seeing what looks just like hand in the clinic, but in fact might be hand plus another a number of components. So the money at the moment is on that um, the, the key things that are driving on the ongoing prevalence of hand in our clinical settings is that there's probably ongoing infection or inflammation and the, the impact of different cardiovascular risk factors upon brain function. So to finish, um, if um, any of you as healthcare practitioners and providers are looking after people or are involved in the care of people or a person who's, whom you think has changed or isn't as uh, alert or as crisp or aware as, as, you expect, as they used to be or as, you, as you'd expect them to be, or if their, their partner or, or friend or sibling, family member says to you, which is often the case the family or the, the spouse, lover uh, mentions it first, then it says they're not something's different. I don't know. That's when that's when you kind of you know you can jump in and um, seize the day and be aware that um, the, the, that in fact there may be a cognitive problem. Might be HIV. Might be something else. And you can refer individuals to, of course, their own general practitioner who might refer them into the Alfred. Or you can uh, try and arrange for patients to come straight to the Alfred where we have a neurocognitive health clinic every uh, once a month on a Friday and uh, you know we're happy to see patients who doctors or, or, or anyone caring for them are worried about. Um, most of the people we see in the clinic are coming because they've got symptoms, they, they are concerned and what happens when they come to the clinic is that we do a really detailed clinical history and evaluation we do a, a screening test for depression and we ask about the use of drugs, of alcohol and other drugs. And according to how the patient appears, they may go straight down the pathway of being referred for a brain scan and neuropsych evaluation. Or in fact, as quite often happens, um, we might refer individuals to see a psychiatrist because really it looks like anxiety and depression and or drug and alcohol um, services. So um, we're really happy to see people. We really want to support them and um, I think HIV associated neurocognitive disorders um, is, a, is a constellation of illnesses that H the HIV affected community is most afraid of. People are really afraid of having gone through all of you know treatment and diagnosis of HIV and taking their tablets and putting up with side effects only to have uh, HIV dementia occurs a really frightening thing. So, 
We want to uh, really make people feel comfortable and there's, there's a lot we can do to help and support and treat people with hands. So um, I think that's all for today. Thank you for your attention. What, so given that you, you described that we've got a mix of people that have had lots of different treatments early on and not perfect sort of treatment, so for the people that are starting newer treatments today, what sort of proportion would you be thinking would get some form of cognitive Im impairment? So for people who are starting tr treatment, say in July 2015, um, perhaps diagnosed in the last year or so with HIV, we know in Australia that um, individuals at the time that they're diagnosed, their CD4 cell counts around 400, 430. So they have you know, mild to moderate immune suppression. Um, if they start treatment fairly soon and uh, they have recovery of their CD4 cells and their viral load is fully suppressed, the likelihood of them um, developing HAND is, is really probably very low. A small proportion of them may already have been developing HAND um, and it's, it, we know from studies that if you uh, def, uh, defer treatment um, to under 350 CD4 cells, then some a small proportion will develop HI, uh, a hand or HIV-associated neurocognitive disorders. But broadly speaking, the average Australian person starting at your retroviral therapy today, probably with about 350, 400 CD4 cells, very unlikely to develop hand. And are there clear differentiating symptoms? that are appearing, that it's different between um, ageing related sort of dementia versus HIV de related dementia. Can you articulate or pinpoint different the way that that presents? I, not clinically, certainly clinically I can't. The neuropsychiatrists or the neuropsychologists, um, when they uh, invite the individual to come and do a, quite a considerable array of tests over two and a half hours or so, they are able to distinguish between changes that are typically associated with ageing versus changes in the brain that are typically associated with HIV having an effect on the brain. At an individual level, I certainly can't tell that, and I don't think um, anyone in the community should um, console themselves uh, by saying, oh, I think I'm just getting old. And I certainly see a number of patients coming in saying, I think I'm just getting old. And I would never, ever, I'd advise people never to um, console themselves with that thought because, it, in fact, it's probably not ageing. There's some evidence that getting older plus HIV is not good news. But um, you really can't distinguish at a clinical level between the two. And you mentioned um, drug and alcohol use. Do you want to comment a little bit more in terms of impact of that in terms of um, HIV, dementia or cognitive in terms of differentiation of HIV you know, impact? Well, again, to just come to, to bring it into a clinical setting when you're interacting with a person, um, you, if, they, if they have symptoms and they're having trouble concentrating and they're not sleeping and they're forgetting things and they have to take a list... But at this, you know, write down a list of things to do. But at the same time, they're also reporting, well, I'm, you know, I'm using um, amphetamines on the weekends, and I smoke, you know, marijuana two or three nights a week, or I, I'm drinking four or five nights a week, you know, and have a reasonable alcohol intake. Then, you, what, what you're, you again, you can't really distinguish between uh, what what's going on there. It, it's certainly some of the. Um, if they're a bit jumpy and anxious, that may be related to um, drug use, may be related to some depression and anxiety that's sitting there as well. And underlying that, there might be HIV dementia. So again, the safest thing to do is to refer an individual so that through history, and it's through history, you can begin to just slightly tease out some of that stuff. So if someone says, yeah, I really started drinking more heavily six months ago, and it's since then that I've noticed this and that. So you actually have to take a really detailed history. But the people who, the, the, the investigation that can really begin to delineate between alcohol, perhaps drug use and, and HIV dementia, again, all my praise is going to the neuropsychologist, so and that's a formal evaluation. And early on, 
in the epidemic, we saw people with significant cognitive impairment. We don't see, seem to see that as much anymore, though we still see people with obviously cognitive, significant cognitive changes. Is that shifting? Will we? Is that really gone? That picture of people with advanced disease. Are we? And why is that? Yeah, I think um, in the nineteen nineties, um, when people uh, there was there was less testing and people were gradually getting sicker and um, th uh, they were not diagnosed early enough, they were becoming more and more vulnerable to developing HIV dementia. So the twenty percent of people who could drop their CD4 cells, so a thousand people in Melbourne were uh, HIV positive, 20% of them, you know, late pres they presented late in those days, 20% of them had HIV dementia. Uh, we would see more of them. Uh, but as I said um, um, in the presentation, uh, and just now, um, the average CD4 cell count now of an individual being diagnosed is much higher and in part that's because there is more awareness, there's been greater education and there's certainly a lot more HIV testing and national guidelines around recommending testing for people who are at risk of HIV. So as I said the average CD4 or the median CD4 cell count is around 400 or so so that's why we're less likely to see people coming in with truly in a, de in a demented state. Um, but having said that, um, here at the uh, at Alfred Health at the Alfred Hospital and in other um, key hospitals around metropolitan um, Melbourne that look after people with HIV, we will still see perhaps a handful of people each year who have uh, new, both newly diagnosed with HIV plus an AIDS illness. And in fact, one of the AIDS illnesses they might present to a hospital with is in fact quite a s severe dementia. So it hasn't fully gone. And perhaps that um, lends itself to um, a, a comment around trying to increase uh, awareness amongst the broader general practitioners who don't have a high HIV caseload, that men, a man or a woman in their uh, 40s and 50s with an early onset dementia and otherwise has been unwell, etc., HIV should be sitting in there as one of the differential diagnoses. Uh, but I think that broadly in my mind, explains why we're seeing so much less of it. And, and of course, we're starting treatment earlier and earlier now, where the guidelines are moving towards offering everyone the opportunity to consider treatment, so that abrogates the, the, the risk of dropping the T-cells down even lower. So I think that that's the other key factor.